All right, Yield Nerds, welcome back. Today, we're going to look at a very left field income producing opportunity. I call it very left field for various reasons, and we're going to get into why that is so. And this is the class of income producing instruments called business development companies. So what are they? And should you take a look at it? My usual disclaimers. This is investment education. It is not advice. I am not a wealth management advisor. I don't have a political stance and I don't have merchandise to sell you. So you do your own research. I'm here to educate you. In terms of what we are going to cover today, we're going to first look at what are business development companies. We're going to look at a few examples of BDCs. And then we're going to look at a couple of ways you can invest in them depending on how you want to think through them. And then really put 2023 into perspective and look at business development companies and ask the question, is the year right? Is the time right? And you get to answer the question yourself as well. For new visitors to this show, the show is organized as a playlist. And if you were to go to this channel and look at the playlist, you will see that every episode is numerically ordered. And we start from about a middle schooler, high schooler who has no introduction to yield investment and then bring it all the way up to topics such as business development companies and so on. So I hope you enjoy that. Okay, what are business development companies? In general, the country works by making capital accessible to companies of various sizes and some of them, the especially the small mid-sized ones may say, I don't want to take money in terms of venture capital. I don't want to give up equity. I'd rather take debt. So you can think of this as venture debt in some ways. And there are many other things that are bundled into a business development company, but venture debt is certainly one of them. So capital flows into small and mid-sized companies in certain ways, mostly as a debt instrument. And for example, there may be a company that makes $15 million in revenue, not your billion dollar big corporation that can throw a bond. And so they have to resort to a different channel of raising money. And venture debt is one such channel and venture debt is one component of what a business development company does. So kind of looking at all of them together, that is in the family of operations of a business development company. All right. Before we get deeper into understanding all the stuff behind the sausage of a business development company, there are a couple of terms that I want to review with you. One is called a closed end fund and the other is called an open end fund. So what's an open end fund? This is one where you raise funds when the investment is created. This could be a corporation that is issuing stock. It could be an ETF. It could be any fund that says we reserve the right to issue new equity. If you reserve the right to sell more shares, that is an open fund. And if you're going to do that, you need to be much more transparent. You need to make sure everybody understands what you are into because they could get diluted. There could be other things going on. Now, the opposite of that is a closed end fund. A closed end fund says we're going to raise all the capital we need the very first time we go public and it is closed for future investments. And that pegs what is called the net asset value on the date the fund is raised. And then it can either trade at a premium to net asset value if things are going well, or it can trade at a discount to net asset value. And so in general, it is pegged to the beginning net asset value as a premium or a discount. And these things fluctuate rather a lot for various reasons that we will discuss. In another part of it is these companies are then free to go leverage. And they can say, I raised 100 million, I'm gonna go you know, borrow 200 million against 100 million, and now I have 300 million to play with. So there is a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes. And so there is some level of concern in a closed end fund as to what is their debt to equity ratio. Because at the end of the day, what you hold is not the original share. You may be one of the people who work directly with the company and you own the original asset. However, in all likelihood, 
you may be buying it in the secondary market and you're buying it in a premium or a discount. So you got to make sure you truly understand what is happening behind the scenes. All right. A great reading here, if you want to get deeper, is the SEC webpage. If you Google SEC closed end funds investor dot gov, you will land on this page that gives you a wonderful review of what a closed end fund is. And you may want to read that. Now let's get back to the business development company. Surprise, surprise. BDCs lend to small and mid-sized companies. And those companies themselves may be private. And commonly, BDCs are closed end funds. You don't really know what is going on. They, they are going to tell you, you know, we're in this area, we're in that area. They may even say we loan to this company but you're not really going to be able to review the exact terms. That is their secret or business trade secret and their argument. And so you accept that when you invest in a BDC. Uh, now we're going to look at some examples. And I want to again say I don't recommend stocks. It's not the game I'm in. And so we're going to look at specific companies just so you understand this at a greater level. You do the due diligence and you decide what you want to do after that. So let's look at a couple of example BDCs. I'm picking alphabetically. I have no allegiance to this company for or against. Aries Capital Corporation begins with an A, so I figured I'd start there. Aries Capital trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol ARCC. They pay a 9.17% annual dividend. It is paid quarterly. And so you look at that and go, whoa, that's even higher than what I can get in the treasury. And so this sounds like a pretty good investment. And then you go into their portfolio page and you say, gee, I wonder what they invest in. And it says, well, there is this Ivy Hill asset management where we have 9.2% of our assets. And then there is this TIPCO where we have a couple of percentage. And then, oh, by the way, you know, healthcare is 10% of our industry. Our biggest industry chunk goes into software. And then in the West Coast, we have 35%. And you're, the, the reason I'm reading these out loud is none of this says they lend it, you know, they lend $10 million to Google and the security is the big blue building on Main Street. That is not how a BDC works. You will know they did the deal. You will know it's in the general area. In some cases, you will know who the company is, but that's about it. So knowing this, you make your own decision of, is that diversified enough for me? Do I have reason to believe small companies, mid companies in this general profile are good enough? Um, behind Ivy Hill Asset Management are a bunch of additional investments. And then you need to go do your due diligence on those. So you can look at this in the AriesCapitalCorp.com in the portfolio page. And that's about the detail you're going to get. Somewhere here, if you scroll down, you will see 9% of their total asset class belongs to preferreds. You don't know which preferreds. Their preferreds obviously are in the underlying companies that they loan. Maybe they have a convertible note. Maybe they have a preferred stock that has already converted. But you're making decisions on your risk reward appetite with imperfect information, or I should say, more imperfect information because at the end of the day you don't have perfect information in anything you buy here is another company again no allegiance you do your own work on this the reason i show aries and prospect and you will find that out in about a couple of minutes is the kind of data that they expose aries chooses to say we are diversified here is by industry here is by geography here is by and so on prospect trades as psec and here, if you go to their portfolio page, they are going to list every little company that they have lent to, whether it is secured or unsecured, but whether they gave a dollar or 10 million or 100 million, you have no idea. And so you can sit here and say, gee, Belnick LLC, what's that? Barracuda parent. Uh, so these are companies you can then Google and you can make your own decision of whether it is good or bad whether it is secure or not, but they have hundreds of these investments. And so you once again have to take information that is available and make a decision just based on that. If you scroll in their page, you will see they do have some unsecured debt as well. And so you have to think through, where do I go from here? 
in their scenario in PSEC, they actually pay dividends on a monthly basis. So that's a very different contrast with Aries. Aries pays quarterly, Aries gives you sector, PSEC pays monthly, PSEC gives you the individual, you know, uh, person who an individual company that actually got the loan, but not really a breakdown from there. So just an idea for you to understand who some example business development companies are, but hold the thought. There are many, many more. Golub Capital, Main Street Capital, Hercules. So if you Google sample business development companies, you're going to find a very long list. There probably are two dozen that are over a few hundred million dollars and then several that are in the smaller range. So it is a big, big pile. So if you were to step back and say, what is a business development company? It's a closed end fund, very much like a hot dog is closed. You kind of don't know what's inside there. And you know, it's a little bit of California, a little bit of software, a little bit of manufacturing, a little bit of secured debt, a little bit of unsecured debt. So it's something. And, and if you have an appetite for that, you're gonna eat that. And that is really a business development company. It does have a much higher yield and you need to think through what is your appetite for risk and how much due diligence you are willing to make. Now, the world of finance is such that you don't even have to stop at a hot dog. You can actually have a platter. What do I mean by that? There are ETFs of BDCs. Talk about a single BDC itself claiming we are diversified across states, across industries, across asset classes. You can then say, well, you know, I'm going to get an ETF of various BDCs and I'm going to decrease my risk. Again, whether or not this is lower risk, I'll let you do the math. Whether or not this somehow is, a, is something that appeals to you, you do the math. There is indeed a business development company ETF called BizD. Uh, you can research them. They will show you which individual BDCs they hold and what percentage of each of those BDCs they hold. And they pay a quarterly dividend of 11%. Again, you decide whether that is the right thing for you. So then we look at, okay, what are my options of investing in a business development company? Well, if you are the risk hot dog eater, so to speak, and you have 20 grand, less than 20 grand, you could have $10, you could have $25 to invest. The easiest way, if this is your jam, is to pick a publicly traded business development company, and or you can put it in an ETF, and you can say, there you go, I own a business development company. If you are a high net worth individual with a lot of money, then you may say, instead of putting it in the publicly traded one, can I go to the fund behind the fund? And there are ways for you to contact these funds. Some of them will say, we don't take direct investments. We only take institutions and their money. There are others who will take individuals if you cut a big enough check. And again, that is entirely up to you. But you need to think through, is the hot dog the biggest source of protein in your meal? Or is it more an addition? What else do you have in your lunchbox? So think through your risk appetite. Absolutely do it before you go into any one asset class in a big way. All right. The next question is the big one. Is 2023 the right time for you to get into a business development company? Well, let's talk about the ideal weather for a business development company. When the corporate bond is only slightly higher in terms of its yield than a treasury bond, what does that say? That says that people feel so good about the health of corporations that they would only pay a really small premium on top of the treasury bond to hold a corporate bond. If you think about that, that tells you the economy has great confidence in corporations. And so you are saying, I will pay barely a half a percent and I will hold a AAA rated corporate bond and pay more, half a percent more than the treasury is really what it is for the same maturity. Meaning if a one year treasury pays 5%, a AAA rated corporation and you decide who it is, it could be Google, it could be Microsoft, there are several in that category that have a lot of cash in the bank, very highly credit rated. So the idea here is saying that a corporate bond of a maturity one year 
only has a risk premium of half a percent over the treasury. When that is the scenario, in general, it bodes well for BDCs. And today, that is the scenario. Today, the premium over the treasury that the corporate bond commands is very small because there is a lot of confidence, at least right now in February 2023. So that, in theory, would bode well for BDCs. Here is the second thing. Most BDCs, when they issue you know, money to the um, lender, uh, sorry, to the company, they are going to say, you will pay us prime plus X percent or LIBOR plus X percent. And there is always a floor. So it's not like if interest rates go to zero, uh, then all of a sudden, or if interest rates are negative, then they make nothing. There is a LIBOR floor, but in general, they will say floor plus X percent is what they get paid. So if short-term interest rates are high, then they are going to get a much higher kicker. So for example, if it is prime plus 8%, I'm just using that as an example, then they would get 5% plus 8% or 13% in terms of their interest today. And so in theory, if you look at these two at face value, you would say this is the perfect time for you to buy a BDC. But bad weather also means impending calamity, meaning is there a chance that corporate bonds will become much riskier in the near future? Is there a chance that in the near future, short-term interest rates would drop? It may, it may not. That is for you to think through and nobody knows for sure. And there is a Fitch Ratings article. It is a fantastic article. I would suggest you Google that and read that from start to finish. They claim that, hey, you know what? Rates are rising, which is going to put pressure on the small company to service the debt. And if there are macroeconomic challenges and they cannot make the money to pay off the debt, then they are going to default. If the company defaults, the BDC will be in problems. And if the BDC has problems, recession may sit in. If recession sets in, the credit spread, as it is called, which is the premium between a AAA rated bond of a certain duration and the treasury of a certain same duration, that will increase, meaning Fitch says the equation may indeed flip. Watch out, be very, very careful. And this was written in November 2022. The reality is the first two months, the market is enjoying some sort of a bull run, whether it is a true one or a false one is up to you. I would caution you and ask you to listen to the last couple of episodes of Yield Nerd. And here is why. You may want to go back to the Fitch Ratings article. Scroll down. I intentionally hid the names of the individual BDCs because I don't want to be in the business of recommending individual BDCs. You may want to go back there and you're going to see that some business development companies have more unsecured loans than others. And if there is a business downturn and the loan is unsecured, good luck. Others have raised so much debt that their debt to equity ratio is incredibly high. And so if the BDC itself has a very high debt to equity ratio, the BDC has to service its own debt. And if they don't have interest revenue coming in because of recessionary pressure, then you got a problem with the net asset value, as it is called, of the BDC, which means you may hold a tough, tough reality if you bought it. Even that is not the full picture. So we've seen one argument that now is a great time based on the credit spread being very low and based on short-term interest being high. We've seen a warning from Fitch and there is another undercurrent which it was discussed in the last two Yield Nerd episodes. There is a debt ceiling crisis going on. What happens if the Fed has to pick and choose what it pays? There is a potential default, which let us hope never happens. There is the threat of a default. It is a guarantee, in my opinion, that the threat is going to become bigger before it goes away. The likelihood that a divided Congress is suddenly going to come together and say, yep, we have resolved all our difficulties and we're going to move on 
that likelihood is pretty low. So there's gonna be some turmoil. Therefore, if there is turmoil, what will happen to the credit spread? You think about it. What would that do to interest rates if there is a threat of a recession or a default? We did a whole episode on that. Long story short, there are huge yield events that are coming up. Don't jump into anything. Step back, do the math, don't act in a rush. Remember to eat more ice cream. What I mean by that is as of now, the debt ceiling discussions are going to come to head in approximately May, something like that. So three month treasuries would be a wonderful thing to buy. And I would not go for long duration right now. Get ready for a yield storm. Thank you for listening to Yield Nerd. I'm happy to chat offline. Here is my email. Have a good day.